We're entering the third week of our uh, Journey Detours Joseph series, and uh, after last week, um, I was immediately told, um, well, of course, by my wife, uh, after the conclusion of our message that about halfway through my Judah portion of the story, I started calling Judah Jacob, which is his father, and I might have confused a lot of different people, and so... um, you know, just anyone can stop me as I'm talking. Like this is we're we're a church, we're a church family, and uh, I yeah, it, it was definitely Judah I was talking about, and not Jacob. I mean, Jacob had a lot of faults, but we're talking about Judah's faults in this story, and so I apologize if I might have confused uh, anyone from that. But as I was comparing the two of uh, Judah and um, Joseph, and their sins and the temptations, sorry, not sins, but temptations that they were facing on how they responded to those temptations. Um, that was the comparison I was, I was doing last week. And as we discovered last week, Judah gave into the temptation and he, and he got into some trouble because of that. But in the end, his consequences from his giving into the temptation that he experienced was more of a, a stain or an embarrassment uh, in his life. And where if you look at, correlate that to Joseph, who never yielded to the temptation, and he was thrown in prison. Because even though he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And as believers, as a reminder, hopefully everyone already knows this and understands that, but as as believers, we're called to be bold in our desire to live a holy and a righteous life for God. We're called to be bold in that. That, that, that's our desire. When temptation comes our way to each one of us, which is going to come for the rest of your life, that we are called to be strong and forceful in our desire to remain pure for the Lord. Above all else, that should be the desire of our hearts, to be pure, to be righteous, as a sign of obedience to God and our desire and our love for Him. It, it, it's like, it, it, I, I gave this illustration to the youth. It's like on, on your wedding wedding day, the reason why a bride comes in, in a white dress because it was a sign of purity, that she saved herself for her husband as a sign of purity for that. And as, as Jesus comes back to us, we want to be dressed in our white robe. We want to be, when Jesus sees us, he wants to, I, I think in each one of our hearts, we want to be seen as, as a white, pure, that we say, God, Jesus, we saved ourselves for you. The best that we can. Um, as I closed last week's message with a, a sneak preview into this week's message, I mentioned that if we were to look at the situation, again, with Judah and Joseph directly following their bow with temptation, it would be tempting for each one of us to maybe want more of Judah's consequences versus Joseph's consequences, where Joseph, sorry, Judah was just kind of, you know, embarrassed and he may be harassed and made fun of by his brothers and by other people that, you know, he did something wrong and got caught doing something wrong and gave him the temptation where Joseph, who did nothing wrong, again, was thrown into prison. And I think if we were to choose, do we want to be thrown into the prison or just to be embarrassed? I think a lot of us probably would rather be embarrassed, would rather just kind of be embarrassed for a little bit until people forget about it or, or whatever versus being thrown into prison. Friends. As we think about that situation, we have to stop looking at our situation that we go through, those situations where, where maybe um, we're going through a struggle or, or a situation. Instead of looking at those situations from a ground level, a ground level perspective, as we're in the trenches in those situations, we have to start seeing them from where God sees those situations from. Okay? So if we look at this analogy as like a plane analogy, a lot of times we, we take it like we're in a car, okay? We take it like we're in a car, maybe even walking around on ground level. And God is looking not only from heavenly spaces, okay, where God is seeing things from a, not more than a 30,000 perspective. He sees it from holding the whole universe in his hands and he can see everything. But, but what God desires from us is to see all situations that we go through from a 30,000 feet. And I think most of us have been in an airplane. Okay, and you start on, it's, a, it's an amazing experience if you haven't, where you start on the ground, well, for some of us it's an amazing experience, some of you hate it, but when you start on the ground and you can only see the planes around, you see the pavement and all you can see are planes, and then you start climbing, you start seeing, oh man, look at all those houses, look at those neighborhoods, and pretty soon when you get up to that 30,000 feet, you can see 
states, like I'm talking multiple states distance. You can see hundreds, hundreds of miles, and it's unbelievable. And if you think about that is a lot of times when we're in a difficult situation, we can only see it from the ground level, and we can only see, man, I'm in this problem. How am I ever going to get over this wall? And if you could only just see from a 30,000 perspective, you can see the finish line. You can see where you're heading, where you're trying to end up. And that's the desire I think God has for each one of us to start looking at that. Remember, in Joseph's story, God had already revealed the finish line for Joseph. That I'm going to make people bow down to you. Your, your family is going to bow down to you. You're going to be important. Okay? You, you're going to have, I'm going to bless your life beyond anything you could comprehend. And his family understood that. And his family knew that. And Joseph knew that. So no matter what happened to Joseph in his life, no matter if he was put into slavery, thrown into a well by his brothers, sold into slavery, and then he was put into prison, Joseph could rest in the promise that God had already revealed to him in his life. That Joseph was going to be have an amazing future, an amazing future in his life. And he could rest in that. Not, and I'm not sure for each one of us if we do that well enough. I'm not sure if we do that. I think a lot of times, as I said, that we kind of ram through a wall. Okay, we ram through a wall and we try to bust through the wall with our head. Oh, come on, open up, open up. Get me out of this situation. And I don't think we understand that the promises that God, and God is going to create a way, whether it's whatever way he creates for us to get around that wall or over that wall or under that wall or however he wants us to get through that wall, but we have to rest that he is going to create a way and it's going to be a good way. So we're going to read this morning Genesis chapter 39, verses 19 through 23. So it's a very short portion of our story. So Genesis 39, 19 through 23, if you want to, uh, follow along with me. I'm going to read it. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph and in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to be successful. Sounds like Joseph, I mean, I, I, sounds like Joseph, as, as, as Nate is walking in here, as our new employee, hey, Nate, strive for Joseph, where everything you do is successful, okay, where I don't have to worry about anything, right? You know, everywhere Joseph went, his father didn't have to worry. Potiphar didn't have to worry. He trusted him, as we read last week. And now in the warden doesn't have to worry about anything as one of his prisoners is taking care of all things in all situations. And I love that. I think that's, I think that's it just, it's just a testament of who Joseph was. However, victim, uh, the word victim is a word that I feel is tossed around these days as though everyone is a victim. Everyone. I feel like in every city, turn on the TV and someone or, or, or Facebook or or. Anywhere, everybody is a victim, and they can claim to be a victim about anything. You literally can sue someone and claim unfair treatment about anything. It's unbelievable, like, like where our country is coming to. Happy Fourth of July, everyone. The freedom to complain about anything. But uh, so let me just, I, I, I decided to Google search, like, the top craziest reasons people sued, and I want to read a couple to you. As, as we think about this, everyone kind of claiming to be a victim in this world. So this will be a little entertaining, I think, for some of you. A man sued Budweiser in 1991 to help him attract, because it did not help him attract beautiful women. Because if you remember back in the day, I, uh, you know, one of Budweiser's main slogans or, or thing was they always had these beautiful women in bathing suits. And so this man was drinking Budweiser and believed that if he drank enough of it, he would attract beautiful women. That he believed their marketing ploy that much. So he sued Budweiser uh, for not because over, the, over years, he never fulfilled his fantasies of having beautiful women fawn over him, uh, as, and it never became a reality. So he sued Budweiser for $10,000, claiming to have suffered emotional distress, mental injury, 
and financial loss. Another one. Pennsylvania graduate school student sues teacher over C plus grade. This graduate student was more than displeased when she discovered that she had a me mediocre C plus grade and it prevented her from getting her intended degree and then becoming a licensed therapist because she got a C plus. According to this graduate student's math, this would cost over the course of time, $1.3 million in lost earnings as she would have made as a therapist. So she sued her teacher because she got a C plus. Not done yet, guys. A $10 dry, <laughs> dry cleaning bill turns into a $67 million civil suit, lawsuit. A, ma a man from the in 2005 was being prepared to become a, a judge, and he was looking forward to, looking forward to his starting a new, uh, new job, and he took a a suit to be tailored at this dry cleaning place, and they lost his pants. The man then went to the dry cleaner and demanded $1,150 for the entire brand new suit. That is an expensive suit. Rather than just money for pants, because he had the rest of it, just didn't have the pants. The owner of the dry cleaner then offered, the first offer to settle was $3,000. I would have taken that immediately. Buy two suits, three suits. I would have bought like eight suits with that amount of money. Anyway, then they countered again to $4,600. And then eventually, the dry cleaners offered $12,000 because they lost his pants. And the man did not take it. He continued to push the envelope, as I said. He eventually got to a nice round number of $67 million and sued them over emotional damages, legal fees, which he represented himself, by the way, because he was a judge, 10 years of car rental fees because he went to other dry cleaners and had to drive to the dry cleaners in another town, I guess, and then the pants themselves, $395, $67 million. By the way, he lost. I would have taken the $12,000. And the last one, a high school student sues for being woken up in class. In 2008, a sleepy 16-year-old kid was sleeping in class, and his math teacher walked over and slapped the desk. Wake up! Slapped the desk. The student's parents decided to sue the high school and the State Board of Education and the city, claiming the student suffered severe injuries to their left eardrum from slapping the desk. They did not win also. Some people rush too quickly to use the word victim and believe that they are all victims in this world. I've done it. I claim, I've claimed multiple times that I've been a victim. Usually it's, it's like to my wife or to Megan. I usually don't tell anyone, and I definitely don't push the envelope to sue anyone over things. But I've, I'll admit it. I've claimed, man, I'm, they're coming after me. People are coming after me. And, and uh, many of us have claimed to be a victim ourselves. I don't think I'm the only one. And I don't think any of us are as crazy as these people on this list. Um, but I think we've all claimed to be a victim at some point in our life. Um, based on how people have treated us. We've said we're a vi victim from unfair treatment at work, probably. Uh, maybe uh, some of these students, I, there's only three here over here now, but uh, maybe a teacher victimized us in school, um, or, uh, or maybe a coach, or a boss, or a friend, or whatever. I, I can't tell you how many times over my course of 20 years of doing youth ministry, I've had students, when I ask them, why do you have bad grades? Why do you have a D, or why do you have an F? Oh, the teacher doesn't like me. Are you kidding me? I, I, every time I tell them, I'm like, stop it now. I'm not, I don't hear another word. You get a bad grade because you don't do work. And you're probably annoying in class. No, I mean, no, I see you in youth group. <laughs> and, and, and it always comes down to, but I love it. Oh, the teachers are so, they're mean to me. They don't like me. They don't want you for another year. Don't stop. They don't want you. They want you to move on. They don't want you. A child is a victim, uh, and how many of you have heard this, uh, their parents, a child's a victim if they have to go clean their room or do their chores. 
I've definitely used it. I think last or two weeks ago, I talked about how I had to do way more work than my, uh, my sister had to do, and I was a victim of the system in our house. But there are real rule, or there are real uses for the word victim. The actual real word for victim is a Latin word for victim, victima, which it actually was used originally when you were sacrificing an animal, like in an animal sacrifice. Okay, so like, like a you were sacrificing in, in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice an animal uh, to pay for their sins. Okay, and this animal had done nothing wrong. I don't. They normally pick the best of the best animals to be the one to be sacrificed. To God, that's that's the way you did that, and so this animal is sacrificed. It's not like you pick the ornery, the ornery goat that you don't like, that you want to get rid of. No, you pick the best of the best. So this is this innocent animal that didn't deserve to be sacrificed, but they were the ones that were chosen to be sacrificed. And there are people that are innocent, like these animals in our world, that are truly victims, um, victims of poverty, victims of abuse, victim of someone with power and authority uh, enforcing that in their lives, a victim because of the color of their skin or, or, or their religious beliefs. People can be victims of ugly rumors, slander, or even violence. I, have a, uh, I remember a, a few years, or a long time ago, I had a friend, and we were praying uh, together. It was an, another youth pastor, and he was praying for one of his friends, and, and uh, we were in deep prayer for this friend because... He had uh, been accused by this teenage girl um, in, um, oh, he was helping at a camp, and he was uh, told, or uh, this teenage girl came out and told, uh, everyone told her parents that he had sexually assaulted her at camp. And he claimed, I never, no way, I, I never did that, never did that. Well, a, a year goes on, he's fired, his wife leaves him, and he's lost his, he's lost his job. No one wants to be around him because everyone believes the, this believe this girl. Well, a year comes by, and the girl comes out and tells her parents that she had lied about it. She had lied about it because she just wanted their attention. Her parents had been ignoring her, and she wanted the attention from people, and she just really enjoyed people. Like, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm so sorry that you're experiencing this terrible tragedy, and that's what she desired. She desired the, the, the response of being the victim, and she des- in the process, she destroyed a man's life lost his family, lost his job, could never be a pastor again, all because a girl wanted to feel what it's like to experience the, the, the victimization of, of, of people coming around you and, and, oh, we are so sorry. So sorry you've experienced this in your life. I know you can think of stories of, of real victims, but for the sake of our subject today, we're talking about people who've experienced unfair experiences in their life that end up being life-altering. But here's the big idea that I want you guys to get out of today as, as we read that passage and as we go through this. When you are treated unfairly, how, when you will, are treated unfairly, which all of us are going to be and continue to be, how will you respond to the unfair treatment? Isn't that the real question that all of us need to answer? Is how will we respond in all these situations in life? Because all of us will be treated unfairly, poorly, the subject of gossip at some point in our lives. And it's going to continue the rest of our lives. So the real question again is not if we will be mistreated, but it's how will you respond when you are mistreated? I think I've told this story before, but when I went to college, and I went to college to play basketball, and uh, I was on, um, for the first two years, there's a lot of people that played basketball, or a lot of players on our basketball team, and they had like a JV team and a varsity team in college at the Christian school I went to, and I was on the JV team the first two years because there was a lot of upperclassmen on the team, and I averaged like in the 20 point-wise, and the best player on the JV team by far, and the coach that I was going to be, that recruited me to play there said, you're going to be on the varsity, going to be playing lots of minutes as a junior and a senior, just wait your time. Well, he left after my sophomore year, and so my junior and senior year, I had, we got a new coach, and uh, over this time, um, over this time, this coach was completely different, completely different style, stuff like that. This coach was all about uh, weightlifting. Really want everyone to have big muscles, because he loved weightlifting, and, and he wanted everybody to be in there lifting weights with him as he lifted weights. Well, something happened to me in college. First of all, I cared more about my education. I also worked probably 20 hours a week at, at other part-time jobs. 
and I was in love with my now wife. And I much rather hang out with my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time, hang out with my girlfriend than go lift weights. I did what I had to do, what was required of me, but I never did what I never did the exceeding things that they wanted. They wanted every, they were gym rats in the gym nonstop. And I, I couldn't do that. I didn't desire to do that. But I still, my game still correlated. I still was playing as well as anybody on the, in the program. Well, anyway, all four, my, in, the story ends with all four years, uh, I ended up being on JV. And the reason, I truly believe the reason was is because, and, and this came from some of my friends in conversations, why isn't Zach ever around? Oh, he's with his girlfriend. Ugh. There's plenty of time after college to have girlfriends and stuff like that. I was in love with my wife, and I was not around because I was working, working, or with my girlfriend, who is my wife of 13 years now, and I'm glad I made that decision. But there was a time when I got to my senior year where I was like, man, why am I even playing this? If I don't want to play JV for four years. I mean, what's it worth my time? And I remember I had a choice to make. Do I quit? Do I quit, or am I going to stick with this? Because this guy is victim. I know this guy doesn't like me, and, and he's putting people on the varsity program who are not as good as me. I'm way better than them. I've proven it. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I, I mean, I, you know, and so I was wrestling around with this. What kind of response am I going to make, just as, as, I, as I'm telling all of you? And I made a decision to play through counsel of other people, and, and to, I wanted to leave a lasting legacy, and I love basketball. And I wanted to play basketball. And later on down the road, when I got to see from a 30,000 perspective, I got to see the impact that I made in people's lives, the younger guys that I got to play with, who were freshmen and sophomores that I got to play with as a senior and build into their life and use it as like a coach on the floor, use it as an opportunity to impact their lives. But for a lot of us, I can say rather confidently, it's in our nature, however, to want to get even. And have our day in court or plan a revenge or someday get justice on people that wrong us. Most of us sort of operate under the assumption that life should be fair. And we firmly believe that when people do something right, they should be rewarded. And when people do something wrong, they should be punished. I think it's built into our psyche what we desire. And it's something that we desire. And I can't tell you how often I tell my kids that life isn't fair. Why does she get this? Or why does he get this? And I'm like, life's not fair. Get over it. Or just when, when I hit the, the worst thing, why can't I have this? Because I said so. Just because. The worst thing, worst ever. And I, I, I tell my kids all the time that life's not fair because I don't want them to be surprised when life slaps them across the face. Because it's going to happen to them multiple times throughout their life. And I don't want them to come into this world thinking that life is fair. Because it's not. Not even close to being fair. We live in a fallen world and we should understand life is not fair. Heaven will be perfect and heaven will be fair. But we are not in heaven. We are still on earth. So don't assume that life will be fair. Okay, God's letting the sin of this broken world kind of play itself out until he returns once again. And unfortunately, and I can say this, and I'm, I'm sad to say this, but at times, even people who claim to be Christians aren't fair and can be some of the harshest unfair people that I know. Joseph was clearly a victim as he was thrown into prison. He had done nothing wrong. When I say he had done nothing wrong, he had done absolutely nothing wrong, at, to the, at least through the scriptures that we've read. He's not like one of those you know, guys in prison that claim innocence. Oh, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I promise I didn't do it. And the, you know, the, the warden or whoever says, oh, they all say that in here. Everybody in prison's innocent. Joseph claiming that as he's in prison, that he's innocent, was the truth. He was the truth. That was, a, that was a, the true statement in his life. Joseph had been treated unfairly by his, by his brothers, by Potiphar, and now by Potiphar's wife. We find him today in prison a slave in a foreign land. So what is going to become of him? Well, Genesis 39, 21 to 23 gives us an insight of what God encounter, how he encounters God in this time in prison. And, and it says that Joseph basically goes to the head of the class. Again, anywhere Joseph is, he quickly rises to the top. 
of where he is. As he stays faithful to God, God rises him up into leadership roles in his life. And ultimately, through Joseph experiencing this prison time in his life, he was able to have a new perspective of life, a new perspective, a new experience. And it was almost as though prison was a blessing in his life because in prison is where God became real to him. In verse 21, I love what it says. It says, and the Lord showed him his faithful love. Where? When he was in prison. Not whenever he was living with his brothers. Not when he was working for Potiphar. But it says that in verse 21, when he is in prison, that God showed him his faithful love. That he experienced God's faithful love in the prison time of his life. At the lowest moment of his life, he experienced God's faithful love to him. Joseph didn't deserve what he got, but he responded to it beautifully. And God rewarded him for his, in God's timing, God rewarded him for his unaltered dedication and faithfulness to him. What experience in your life are you facing? Or have you faced that is unfair? What situation are you living in this morning or in the past that you're still working out that you feel like you are imprisoned by? Is it your, a relationship that you have with somebody? Is it a debt? How about a loss? How about an illness? How about maybe you're passed over for a promotion that you deserved? Maybe you were lied about. Maybe you were hurt over unmet expectations in your life. Maybe it's all the disappointments in your life that you've had to go through. Maybe it's all the failures that you've had. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe you were left with a mess from somebody else that you inherited that you didn't deserve to have to go through. Or maybe you were thrown in a situation that you didn't create for yourself. Or perhaps you didn't have the opportunities in life that someone else had and you feel that it was unfair and it's too late for you to experience those. It, it really is, is not about will things happen to you It's, will you continue to rest for the rest of your life? Will you continue to have the mindset and learn as Joseph learned to continue to trust God and his plans for your life in the midst of those prison moments in your life? Will you trust God and see as God sees from his 30,000 foot perspective that God is real? And that God desires to bless you and reveal his faithful love to you in those prison moments of our life. In the midst of those difficult journeys for each one of us. Proverbs 3 and 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding, but to trust in him. And when the Bible says that, it's serious. Our hearts are deceitful. Your emotions fluctuate. You can be happy one moment and sad the next moment. Your understanding of life and situation does is not the overall picture. God has the big picture for each one of us. God never lies. God never changes. And God knows all. Will you trust him? When you're going through difficult times in life and you're walking through hard journeys, will you trust the one who says, trust in the Lord with all your heart? Not in your own abilities. Depend on him for your own under, for understanding. Depend on him. You can say, I don't get this. Why am I going through this? I was faithful to you. I was like Joseph. I was faithful. I did everything you asked me to do. Why am I going through this difficult time, this difficult journey? And we need to sit back and be like, I trust you, Lord. I'm going to still choose purity. I'm still going to follow you. And I'm going to trust that you have a good plan for my life. And I'm going to depend on that to get me through that. Get me through this time in my life. If we can be faithful and trust God who sees all, who's planned out all, we can experience the blessings that come from our prison moments. Will we choose to be faithful like Joseph and flourish even in the midst of prison moments of our life.
Do you get that? Joseph was in prison and still flourished. A lot of times, all of us can, all we can do is look at our situations, our prison moments, and be like, why am I going through this? Why, God? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you punishing me? Why are you doing this? And Joseph, it doesn't say it. I mean, maybe he did cry, or maybe, maybe he did weep. Maybe he did yell at God. I don't know. It doesn't mention it. But all I know is he was faithful to God, trusted God, because God flourished him. He rose to the head of the class quickly, quickly becoming the warden's favorite. And I think God, even in the midst of our prison moments, God wants to do something amazing in your life and wants to reveal himself to you, wants to do something awesome in your life. But I think we spend too much time looking at that wall that's flat in our, that, that we're running our head into. Oh, God, why are you putting me in this situation? Take me out. Take me out. And God's saying, hey, turn around. Look, I'm ready to bless you right here. I want to bless you right here where you are. I want to bless you. Will you let me bless you? Nate, Jessica, you can come over. Go ahead and have a sway. Will we choose to be faithful like Joseph was faithful? In the midst of our prison, will we focus on the situations we are in and not, sorry, will we focus not on the situations we're in and focus on what God has in store for our life. You know, I had a conversation. I was able to have a conversation with my brother yesterday, and we were just kind of hashing over things in old times, and, and uh, I, I made the comment that I don't think if I could go back in time and change the things in my life that I've gone through and endured, if I would do that, if I had an opportunity to do that, I don't think I ever would because I love what God has taught me through the hard, difficult times in my life. At the moment, I hated them. Couldn't stand them. Wish God would have taken me out of them, never let me carry the, that burden, those cups. But as I think about them now and see who I've become today, as I've gone through the fire and, and he's molded me and made me through difficult situations, I would never want that back because of what he has revealed to me and showed to me, his deep, unfailing, faithful love to me through those prison moments in my life. I would never want to take that back for an easier path never want it back. As much as at them, in those moments I wanted those burdens taken away from me, I would never want that back. God wants to bless you in prison. God is real. and He wants you to experience his love no matter what journey, what path you're in and what path he takes you. And just hold on to the fact that he has a good plan for you. And the dark times doesn't mean it's the end time. He's got a good plan for you. We're going to sing a song. Actually, Nate and Jessica are going to sing a song. And if you saw it on Facebook, Jessica sang this song on Facebook, and, and a lot of people responded to it. So I wanted to have it. But it talks about the goodness of God and that he's always been faithful. And as you enter those dark moments and those prison times of your life, that's what you cling to. It's not the first time. It's not the first prison you've ever had in your life. It's not the first dark time in your life, and it won't be the last. But what we can hold faithful to, hold on to is that he's always been faithful. Through every one of those times that he's always been faithful and cling to that and shown us his goodness and show his love. And that's what gets us through the next one and the next one and the next one because we live in a fallen, broken world. And when we get to heaven, that's all gone. But while we're here on earth, let's cling to that. Will you please?